What's going on, Real Life fam? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We're also excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life. And we believe that that day could be today. We would love it if you share this experience by clicking the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about that time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. morning. Okay. That's not natural. Somebody set me up. Was that my boy? He told y'all. To... <laughs> wow, I'm hyped now. Let's go. Hey, it's great to see you guys. It's great to have our campuses connected too. We love y'all. That was a great, I mean, I'm just ready to pray and go home. I feel good. It, which is really cool because today we're in the series Level Up. I love the series. And uh, actually, God had me switch up the message this week. And what we're going to talk about today is leveling up our joy. Going to level up our joy. Most people in our culture lack joy in a big way. And as, however you came in here, this is always true. God loves you the way you are. God loves you where you are, but he also loves you too much to leave you there. And so he invites us to level up, to grow in our faith, and to go to the next level in Christ, to go forward and to grow. And it's not about what he wants from us. So often we get hung up, we think God wants things from us. It's really about what God wants for us. He occasionally asks for things from us because he has something better for us. And that's especially true when we're talking about joy. Uh, what God wants for us versus what most people are actually experiencing is a huge gap. Here's what Jesus says in John 15. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, whole, full. Jesus says, I want you to have joy. I want you to have my joy and I want your joy to be complete. Not come and go joy like the culture. Not circumstantial joy. Not conditional joy, but continual, constant joy everlasting overflow joy. That's what Jesus wants for us. Does that sound good to anybody else? Like real joy. Some of you are like, eh, yeah, I guess that's all right. Because that's our culture, right? Like the truth is, if we are, and we all are at some level, a product of our culture, our culture is, yeah. That's kind of what, actually like the word in our culture, I saw it on a shirt the other day, three letter word, meh. Meh. Had a little period at the end there. Like, that's it. Just meh. Like, I'm like, this is our culture right now. It's just meh, eh, mm, mm, eh, mm, meh, blah. These are our words. And you see it like anytime you turn on the news, you're watching uh, people talk about, the, I call it a boohoo culture. That's what we live in right now. Everybody's boohooing about something, whining about what something, somebody did, some, something somebody said, whining back and forth about things. It's a boohoo culture. We're always boohooing about something. But one of the things I love about God is he says he wants to turn our boohoo into woohoo. Come on, somebody. <laughs> If you didn't come in with joy, I'm praying you leave with it today. But actually, he says sorrow will last through the night. It's going to happen. It's going to come. But joy comes in the morning. As believers, that sorrow is never meant to stay. But he's promised us joy. He says, I want to turn your boo-hoo into woo-hoo. Jesus said this in John 16. You will grieve. He's talking to his disciples. That's part of life. You're going to grieve. But your grief, if you're in him, will turn to Joy, John 16, 20. Jesus says, I want to turn the boo-hoo into woo-hoo. I want to wake some people up and fill some people up with the joy of the Lord. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. We want to be strong in him and in his joy. And so I want to talk about that today. And I think this is true for you because I think it's true for everyone that all of us were created in God's image as emotional beings that have a built-in warning system. 
a built-in detection system to know when things aren't right. And one of our problems in our culture is we, we have started to ignore the warning signs. And we've even started to diminish the power and effectiveness of the built-in system God gave us, our emotions. In our culture, we tend to not respect emotions. We say things like, you're being emotional. It's like, oh, you think I'm being emotional now? It's about to get emotional. Anyway, I'm saying, we say it like it's a negative. Of course I'm being emotional. I am emotional. I was made in God's image. God is emotional. Read the Bible. He's like, I'm jealous. I'm angry. I'm hurting. I love you so much. I wish you'd come back to me. Like, you're like, whoa, God has emotion? Yes, and I was created in his image with those emotions. I'm going to feel. But in our culture, it, it feels wrong to feel. It's like, oh, that, that response, that was an emotional response. All responses have emotion unless you're suppressing or denying your emotion, which is emotional immaturity. And that's what a lot of people think if they're not emotional, that they're mature. Actually, they're just emotionally immature and they're not in touch with and expressing properly their emotions. Okay, we're talking about emotions right now. They are never supposed to be in control, but they are supposed to be under the control of God, but they are supposed to alert us to things that are out of control. Does that make sense? My emotions aren't supposed to be in control, but they're supposed to alert me to things that may be out of control. My emotions aren't the problem, but they let me know when I have a problem. That warning system, that uh, uh, you have it on your phone. How many of you, some of y'all are crazy. How many of you let your phone go all the way to zero and just die? And then you plug it in. Let me see. Wild. Y'all live on the edge. I need to know how you do it. Like, what do you actually feel? Because, you know, when it goes to 20%, it gives you a warning, right? Battery life, 20%. And it goes from green to what color? It, mine goes red. I don't, do you have some other phone? She said yellow. I don't, see, you're not even looking. You're just letting it die. Mine goes from green to red. Green is good. Red is bad. We know this, right? Green means go. Red means stop. When it gets to 20% for me, I look like, oh, if I ever let it get that low, I'm plugging that thing in right away. I have battery packs on me right now. I could just hook it into my body. I am not going to let this thing die. I might miss something. I texted Daniel the other day at eight in the morning. He says, hey man, sorry for the slow response. I got to be honest. My phone died and I'm texting you from my iPad. I'm like, it's eight in the morning. How is your phone dead? He said, oh, I didn't charge last night. I was like, we're going to get elders involved in this. Something's wrong with you. It goes 20%, you get a warning. What happened? When's the next one? 10%, you get another warning. That's like, Bee -doo -dee -doo. you better plug this thing in or you're going to miss something. The same thing is true with your car. You guys, you know about the low fuel warning? Pretty much every car has a low fuel. I love to play this game. All right, the low fuel warning, my, my first one, because I drive an SUV, so my first one starts at 50. 50, at 50 miles till empty, I get a little thing and it says low fuel warning. And it'll say 50 miles until, it's kind of like, it's a suggestion. At that point, that's like a buddy going, hey man, no big deal, but just, hey, something to think about. Put a pin in this. For future reference, you may want to consider getting fuel. Oh, okay, thanks man, yeah. But then the next one's at 25 miles till empty. And it's like, Dude, remember when I was talking to you earlier about, I, that's starting to become a problem. You may want to look into it. Like, oh, okay, it comes on again, 25 miles. But the next one, 10 miles till empty, it comes on and it stays on and it's a different sound. And it's like, bro, I ain't trying to get stuck out here, okay? <laughs> I ain't trying to run out of gas. Go pull over and get fuel. And if you follow me on Instagram, you already know. I like to play the game. You know the game? Some of you, like you'll DM me like, I don't know how you do it. But for me, I don't have time to be spending half my life at gas stations, so I only fill up when I'm empty. So I wait till the very, I won't do it to my phone, but I'll do it to my car. And I'll post these stories on my Instagram of like, I'll slide in there with one mile till empty. Oh, y'all don't know how to live by faith until you know you could be stuck. Halfway there, living on a prayer. I'm like, I've, I have slid into that sit go with zero till empty. And you know, it's like, you have zero miles till empty? Lies. You could go two, three, four miles. I don't know past that, but I'm just like, let's see how far we can take this in Jesus' name. I, it's wild, it's wild, but what happens? Here's what you know, because how many of you have run out of gas? Is that not the worst? Oh my, you've run, I've run out of gas. 
And that's like, you played the game and you lost. You, your phone might die, but if you're standing next to your car on the side of the road with your thumb out, that's a bad day. But what happened? We ignored the warnings. The warnings were there. They were trying to alert us and tell us what was coming, and we didn't heed the warnings. And so then you run out of gas. Your phone dies. What I think is happening in our culture, what I think is happening to so many people that we know and that we love is that we have learned to ignore the warnings. We've learned the, the beeps and the alarms and all the things, and we've learned to just go, yeah, whatever. And we've learned to look the other way and just keep going. God designed us to know when our battery's getting low, when we're running out of fuel. He, we have emotions to tell us something's off, something's not right. I'm feeling, uh, I'm not myself today. You know, I'm in a season where I've just been really tired lately. I've noticed that my responses are a little bit shorter with people. I, my patience is, these are all part of God's warning system to let me know, hey, something might not be right. I, I was actually talking to a pastor friend of mine. We were on the phone and he was just like, yeah, just lately I've just been really tired. I just feel a little bit off. I was like, yeah, kind of me too. And at this time of year, it's kind of common. Ask a teacher how they're feeling at the beginning of May. It's been a long year. They're ready to get to the beginning of June, right? It's like... <laughs> Free the teachers, Lord, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Set them free. It's hard. And they start off the year, woohoo, and they end that year, boohoo. Anyway, because it's hard to keep it going. And it's like that in ministry, too. And you have Easter and you have Baptism Sunday, and you just get like there's seasons for things, right? So we were talking about that. And, and I tell you that because I want you to know it's not bad to feel bad. We need to give ourselves permission to not always feel the right thing. It's not necessarily bad to feel bad because our problem is that double negative is sometimes we feel bad because we feel bad. And, and we're mad at ourselves and we're down on ourselves because we're down. Like we're the ones heaping. And it's like, hey, you don't feel the right way and that's okay. Like maybe that's your body alerting you to something. That pain is there. That tension is there, that drain is there, that melancholy is there, that depression is maybe even setting in 50 miles till empty, 25 miles, we're getting close, 10 miles till empty, we need to refuel. It's, time. it's all God's warning system to let us know we need to get back to Jesus. Head to the nearest charging station, refuel, you're running out. And so, I'll give you time to clap, I'm okay with that, I can pause for that, praise God. <laughs> Pastor friend and I, we, we concluded on the phone because I, I said, you know, at this point, we're, we're supposed to be encouraging each other, but what we're actually doing is commiserating. You know what that is? We're co-miserating. We're both miserable and we're doing it together. That's what we do. We co-miserate. Hey, I'm miserable and alone. Will you do it with me? Sure. Yeah. Nobody should be miserable alone. Let's be miserable together. We co-miserate. And it's like, now we're just, what do we need to do? And it was like, we had this great idea. We're like, why don't we pray? Can you imagine two pastors on the phone and one of them comes up with the idea of maybe we should pray? I was like, wow, we are so spiritual. So we prayed. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is you actually feel the phone start to charge. You see it go from red. You see the lightning bolt on there and you start to feel it getting the juice again because you've invited the Lord into this. And I'm saying this is what we need right now. And the reason I switched the message even is because I'm, I'm seeing so many people stuck when they could level up with the Lord. And Here's what Jesus teaches us in John chapter 15. Man, this one will change your life. He says in, in uh, verse four, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You gotta stay charged up. He says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You're going to run out of juice. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away. It withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. It'll be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus says, here's how it goes. I'm the vine. I'm the source. I'm the juice. I'm the plug, I'm the charging station, I'm the fuel for your life. You need me and without me, you'll go to zero real fast. Apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. You're not getting anywhere. You're gonna run out. And 
And this is true, and I think so many people experience the reality of what Jesus is saying, and we run out of gas. The problem is we begin to look to other things to fill us back up. We're out of gas. We're at zero. We need something. And what the problem is we look for things other than Jesus to fill us up, to pick us up, to keep us going. We look for other people to pick us back up. You know, well, I'm, I'm down. Can you just do this for me? And can maybe if I get around them, maybe if we go to a party, maybe if we hang, we look for experiences, we look for thrills. We live, y'all, we live in Central Florida. Our entire economy is based on escape. It's based on not feeling the things we really are feeling and dealing with those, but actually chasing a better feeling. Running, what do we call them? Amusement parks, right? Amuse me, I feel down. Are you not entertained? We go to the amusement park because... Well, we need something to escape. I want to go. And we live in the epicenter of amusement and escape. And that doesn't always work. You go to the park a few times. I mean, if you're looking for an amusement park to make you feel better and you stand in a three-hour line in July, well, now we got to go out for a drink. And so we go out for a drink. But I can still feel those feelings, so I have another drink. And then I feel those feelings more often, and so I keep drinking, and I'm drinking more than I ever did, and then maybe it's, hey, you know, I, I don't know, I don't feel good, let's go out to eat. Food, comfort food, isn't that what we call it? Dude, is food not the best thing when it's in your mouth? <laughs> and is it not the worst thing when it's in your belly? <laughs> it's like, mmm, tastes so good, and it's like, oh, 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 I ate too much. Like, it's comfort, though, we, we run to things other than Jesus, and for some of us, it's let's, shopping. Let's go shopping. I just want to feel good again. Let's go to the mall. Oh, that's the last place I'd go if I wanted to feel good. But some people run there because if I can just swipe my credit card, isn't that a great feeling? Woo! Uh, now, opening the envelope of the bill is a terrible feeling, but swiping the card, let's go shopping. Let's go on vacation. We need to escape our reality. Let's go buy a car. There is no, dude, is there, there is no feeling like buying a new car until you get it home. Driving it off the lot, you're in a new car, you get home, you're like, it's used now. <laughs> Ew. This is what we do. We run from thing to thing. Here's the problem. Jesus says, apart from me, you're gonna run out of gas, you're gonna run out of juice. I'm the source, stay in me, and if you stay in me and I stay in you, you will be okay, you will bear fruit. But we run to the culture instead of Christ. When we run out of fuel, we run to the culture instead of Christ, and it doesn't work. And that's why so many people are at zero and going from, we're trying to be filled by the wrong things. We're on fumes because we're being filled but by the wrong stuff. Worldly joy is based on momentary feelings that come and go. Jesus is an eternal wellspring, he says. He's a river of life. If we drink that water, if we're in that stream, he says it's a river of life that is produced from inside you and it never runs dry. Real joy isn't conditional or circumstantial. It's continual and eternal. Thank you, Lord. Real joy isn't the result of a circumstance. It's rooted in a savior that loves me and supplies for me. We have joy not because things are good. How you doing? Oh, good. Things are good right now. Great. How you doing? Ah, things are really bad right now. So I'm bad. We, we have joy not because things are good. We have joy because God is good. And he has given us his spirit and he's with us. We have joy not because it's all fine, but because he's faithful, even when it's not fine. This, this is a game changer. And so this is so important because what we usually do, we usually treat the symptom, not the cause. This is true in our medicine. This is true in everything in our culture. We treat the feeling rather than the problem. And what we as Americans will often do, we go for the short-term fix rather than the long-term freedom, which usually takes more work. And, and I want to speak to you today. Uh, some of you feel some deep things. Some of us are more in touch with our emotions. Some of us are more overwhelmed and overcome by our emotions. We are more naturally emotional, and that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. It can feel like that, but that's a beautiful thing that you're in touch, that you, some of us think deeply, some of us feel deeply. Some of you feel dark things, and some of you deal with depression. 
Uh, I know for me, there was a season where I just couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. All I knew to do was keep going and believe that it would be there someday. Thank God it was and it was him. But I'm saying, I know what it's like to feel the dark things. So does Jesus. Can I just say, because we can get so down on down feelings and negative about negative feelings, we forget that the son of God, Isaiah says he was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He was dealing with heavy stuff all the time. When he cried in the garden, it was like sweat drops of blood. He had some kind of medical condition. It, there was so much pain in, in his prayer. It, he cried, Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible. He experienced pain and loss. Like, can I suggest not all of our negative emotions are bad. They're reminders to return to the Lord. Be honest about your emotions. Hey, this is crazy, but you know, like we like to just medicate and move on. We like to tonight, I'm fine, I'm okay. But what he's asking us to do is say, Lord, I'm depressed. Jesus, can you help me? I wanna bring my depression to you. You will not mess the Lord up. He'll be like, I know, I saw it. Come on, let's talk about it. I understand that. Um, Lord, I'm, I'm lonely. I know, I, I know you get it because you were all alone at times, but I just feel like nobody understands me. Nobody gets me. Nobody's for me. You say you are, but I, you say you're with me and I'm not feeling your presence right now. Can we talk about that? Can we talk about like, I've been in a slump for, things keep going bad and I keep wondering when they're gonna turn around. Can we talk about this? Here's what Hebrews 4 tells us about Jesus. And I, I love this. Hebrews chapter four and verse 15. This is one to memorize. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. I'm gonna say that again. We do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize, not sympathize. When somebody sympathizes, that means, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what that's like, but that sounds bad. When you empathize, you say, I've been there. I feel that, I get that. We do not have a God who doesn't get it. But in fact, it says that we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Woo, yet he did not sin, thank you, Lord. You know what it's like and you beat it. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He's saying, Jesus, I understand. God gets it. And he's not gonna judge you. He actually wants to help you. It's what he wants for you, not from you. Come to him with your emotions. Come to him and be real. If you wanna level up your joy, this is the first one. I'm gonna give you three points today. The first one is return to Jesus. If you wanna level up your joy, where you're at, you may have come in here full of joy and you might think, I could squeeze a little more in here. Some of you may have come into a very dark season and you're thinking joy's not even an option. I'm telling you, your joy starts by returning to Jesus. Get back in his presence. Get back in his word. Get back on your knees. Spend some time with him. You know what, it reminds me of my little robot vacuum cleaner. You got one of those robot, you got robot vacuum cleaners? You better get one soon because the whole world's gonna be robots in a minute. You better at least start with a little vacuum cleaner. But I got the little Roomba and it happens every, all the time. Here's what I hear from the other room I'll hear. Error one, error one, return to base. Error one, return to base. <laughs> Low battery, return to charging station. <laughs> and you hear this the little guy's just doing, but I'm like, that's my life. Right there, that little robot is doing and modeling for me what I need to be doing. Low battery, return to Jesus. Error, error. Justin, you have become a jerk. Return to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go, go back. Error one, Justin, you are out of juice. Return to charging station. Turn around, go back, go back to Jesus. It's all of, we're built in warning systems with our emotions telling us go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, low battery, refuel, recharge, refill. And I'm gonna give you another part of this. So the first one's return to Jesus. The second one is something that's missed by a lot of people. It's so important, but it's also a little unpopular. But if you're missing joy in your life, if your warning system is talking to you, return to Jesus. And the second thing I would say is repent of sin. Repent of sin. Because sin is a condition that affects every area of our life. And here's the thing about God. God doesn't just want us to feel better. That's what we want. We all just want to feel better. Our culture is all about just make me feel better. Get me through this. Give me something to help me with this. God doesn't just want you to feel better. He wants you to be better. Jesus isn't just trying to help you feel better. He's trying to help you 
be better and get better and become like him. Not just receive the fuel that he has, but actually release the failures that you've committed. We, we go to Jesus to give us strength and we need him to take our sin away. Actually, that Roomba, you know, one of the things it does, it goes back to the charging station when it's full. I've noticed this. Sometimes, because I'm like, you're not done yet. I see a, come back here. Get, get over here and get this dog hair. And it's not, it has to go back because it's full. It's picked up so much junk doing its job. Anybody feel me? It's, it's accumulated so much stuff from other people and other things. It's just so full right now. It's got to go back. And when it plugs back in to that base, it, it sucks up the stuff. It's, and it just takes all the junk. And I'm like, Lord, that's what you told me you want to do. You said, actually, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. So let's not even, it's a sin situation. We all have it and we need help. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we hook back up, if we return to Jesus and repent of sin, we're forgiven, purified, cleansed. He says it again, though. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. I believe a lot of what we call mental health in our culture is really spiritual health. I'm not saying we don't have mental health issues in our culture. We absolutely do. A lot of what we call emotional health is really spiritual health. It's all connected. And what we do is we we'll address our mental health, we'll neglect our spiritual health. A lot of what we prescribe as self-care really should be soul care. And I need to come back. What I'm experiencing is the weight and consequence of my sin. I've done the wrong thing. God said, don't do this or else. I did it, and guess what? God said, actually, I need you to do this, and I didn't. And so I feel the natural consequences of sin. Guilt, shame, depression, anxiety. Those are actual natural consequences of being outside of God's will. And sometimes they are there to remind me to return to base and repent of sin. Let him empty you out of all this junk. David says this in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one. Man, you're doing good. You got joy who's, if your transgressions are forgiven. That tank is emptied. It's been cleaned. Who's, blessed is the one whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. You got right with God. You feel good. Now, on the contrary, when I kept silent, unconfessed sin, my sin didn't, wasn't repented of. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. A lot of people I talk to ex exactly tell me these symptoms. I just feel exhausted. I just feel overwhelmed. I just feel heavy. I just feel like this oppression. I just feel like I, I don't have any energy. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, did not cover up my iniquity, and I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Just like Jesus is the source of spiritual health, sin is the source of spiritual unhealth. And it has consequences, not just spiritually, but physically, mentally, and emotionally. And so if, if we're gonna have joy and we're gonna keep joy and we're gonna level up in our joy, we're gonna have to return to Jesus and repent of sin. And then this last one you're gonna hate me for, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. If you don't like it, you can leave. It's your life, it's fine. The rest of us will stay and get right with God, but it's cool. Um, but this one's gonna be hard for a lot of you. We're gonna return to Jesus, we're gonna repent of sin, and the third thing to level up your joy is you gotta relinquish control. Relinquish control. Making Jesus Lord of your life is really just agreeing with God that he's God and you're not. It's really, it's really handing the reins of your, the control of your life over to Jesus. That's why we, every time somebody gets baptized, what's your good confession? What is it? Jesus is Lord. Here you go, Lord. You drive. I'm throwing you the keys. I'm signing the deed. You have power of attorney. That it's all about lordship. And so much of our life is a battle for control. And, and so much of this lordship issue, it's who's in control. Is it him or is it me? If I could give you one hack, like today, you're like, yeah, he kind of rambled on about some things. I don't know. He was talking about joy, but he was wearing brown. I don't know. I didn't really get it. <laughs> if you leave here with joy, you'll know it wasn't the outfit. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of drab. 
If you, could, if you leave here with one thing, one hack, one cheat code for your faith, it would be check your control. Check your control. Because whoever's in control of your life, check the areas of your life where you're frustrated. Who has the control? Because you can, here, here's what I'm gonna tell you. You can either have joy or control, but you can rarely have both. You can either have joy or you can have control, but you can rarely have both. Family vacation. You know, the, you spend a lot of money, you plan the vacation, you go on vacation, the kids are having fun, everybody's running wild, woo Who's the one person having the least fun? The one that planned the trip. Because nothing's going right. It's like, oh, it's fine, it's great. No, 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 we were supposed to be there five minutes ago. They messed up our reservation. That wasn't the room I ordered. I can't believe this. We don't have time for a bathroom break. Some of y'all are from families. Okay, cool. You know what I'm talking about. The, the person having the least fun is the person in charge of it. Ask me how I know. I planned a lot of vacations. It was stressful. And now, you know what I do? We do all inclusive. It actually doesn't cost more if you do the math. There's so many things that for Robin and I, we just like to go hiking. So all we need is somebody to drop us off on a trail and give us a map and say, go for it. And we're like, great. All inclusive. You do the planning. You do the cooking. You do the driving. You do the work. I show up and I go on vacation. Jesus is saying, that's what I want for your life. I want you to live like a child and trust your father. I want you to give me control. I'll do the planning. I'll do the producing. I'll take care of the details. You just follow where I lead. You just listen to what I say. It's so simple and it's so beautiful. But when you're in control, man, you can either have control or you can have joy. With control comes expectation. And you, it's gotta work out right and it never does. And then you think that's on you, and so you gotta control more. Intensity, frustration. Jesus in Matthew 11 says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Whew. Come to me, all you people in Central Florida running around from thing to thing. Come to me, all you people who moved here from Miami because you were weary and burdened. Because <laughs> you were from New York and New Jersey. Anyway, <laughs> we know about this. We know about this life. No, don't, don't talk back at me. You moved here because you need the rest. <laughs> you moved here because you want this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, running around, whoo, burned out. He says, and I will give you rest. That's what we're looking for. Take my yoke. Hold on, wait, what? Take my yoke. The yoke was the thing they would put on the oxen to control it on the horse, it's like the bit. He's saying, give me control. Take my, you got your yoke, you're in control and you see where that's gotten you. Take my yoke upon you, give me control. Learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Whose hands is your life in? That's really what it comes down to. Who has the control? It's about what, oh man, the stuff that you're going through and deal, whose hands are you putting that stuff in? It's all about whose hands. It, it, actually, this week, this was funny because I, um, I was working on sounds for guitar because I'm in a band and I'm working on these and, and I'm not good with all the pedals and stuff, you know, all the electronics. And when I was playing in the 90s, it was all these analog pedals and now they got these pedal boards and they can do so much more, but I just don't know how to do it. So I'm trying to find all the sounds and uh, our new worship pastor, Paulo. Have you seen this guy? Paulo. Paulo Paulo's here. Paulo's right there. You, if you have seen him and you've noticed him, he, he looks like a Viking in a leather jacket. Okay, now you know who I'm talking about, right? You're like, oh, I don't think I know him. He comes from the land of the ice and snow, right? Okay. <laughs> actually, he was playing bass today. Okay, so Paulo, so, so Paulo is actually, like he, he, he's our worship pastor. He also plays at a lot of different places and a lot of different bands. So I'm like, he can help me. He said, yeah, sure, I'd love to help you with that. I kind of know that. So we were kneeling down, we're working on the pedal board and I'm playing these little riffs and, and he's working on getting the right sound for it. And, and then he said, here, actually, it'd be easier if I just play it, can, you, can I just hold the guitar. I was like, absolutely. I handed him the guitar. He plays the same thing I was just playing. It sounded so much better. <laughs> we played the same thing. We've, I've been playing these songs for 30 years. I'm like, I, but how did you just play the same thing and why did it sound better? I didn't say anything. I just listened. I was like, yeah, well, what about the solo part of that? And he plays it exactly. I was like, 
oh. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I was like, you know what? Hey, would you mind just taking my place and being the guitar player in my band? Because <laughs> you're just better. I was, it was amazing. My guitar, I love that guitar. And I feel like that guitar sounds pretty decent in my hands. In his hands, it sounds amazing. It sounds so much better. In his hands, it's actually capable of so much more. I have limitations. I'm not that good. He can do so much more. Actually, in his hands, God can use it and it can change lives every weekend. We see it. Thank you, Lord. I'm saying when you put your life in his hands, it's about whose hands is it in? I'm telling you, when you take your stuff, your life, your challenges, your gifts, you put all of that in his hands, it sounds so much better. It plays so much better. And, and the potential, all the limitations that you had when you were in control go away. Jesus says, apart from me, you're playing on your own. It's not going to sound that great. You can't do it. It's not going to work. But you, you put that in my hands and you and me, if I remain in you, and you, there's no limit to what we can do. When you start to harmonize with heaven and you make that new stuff, the first note you hear is God, you make Jesus Lord and say, here, I'm putting my life in your hands. The first thing he does, it's like, whoa, I, like, I don't want that back. You play, it's better. Those of us who have been following Jesus, we're like, yep, you know better, you play better, it sounds better. I wanna keep it in your hand. Whose hands are, are, your life in, are you putting your life in? Because when you place your life in God's hands, can I just tell you, I know we struggle with control, but those are very capable hands. Those are the hands that form the heavens and the earth. Those are the hands that David says, knit you together in your mother's womb. Ooh, gentle, delicate, precise hands, powerful hands that created the heavens and the earth. Those are the hands that without restraint or constraint went to the cross and have holes in them for you. Those are the hands that promised to go back to heaven and prepare a place for you and they're building you a home in, in the Father's house. Those are capable hands. That's why I think the best thing that any of us could ever do when it comes to our emotional health, when it comes to our joy, is let go, surrender, and give him control. Relinquish the control. Release it to him. Even our junk, you know what he says? He says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Back that Roomba up and let me get rid of it. Like, I'm telling you, I'll take it all. And what I found about Jesus is it's not just that he takes it, but it's what he does with it. He can take my problems and somehow turn it into his promise. I'm like, how did you take my mess and work it into some kind of masterpiece? That's what he does. Even my pain, I've watched him turn that into my gain. James says we consider it pure joy when we, pure joy, why? When we face trials of many kinds because we know that the testing of our faith develops perseverance and it's gotta finish its work so that we can be mature and complete, not lacking anything, not lacking anything. What does that tell me? Well, God wants something for me, not just from me. He has so much more for me. He says, if you can push through, even your pain, I can turn that to gain. And so today we choose joy. And we choose joy by choosing Jesus. We, we do this by, it's so simple. We're just going to return to the Lord. We return to Jesus. We repent of our sin. And we relinquish our control to him. And when you do that, you'll level up to a life that's better than you could ask or imagine. You'll level up to the life that he's always wanted for you. That he actually died to give you. You'll level up to the life that's free. He says, I want to give you life to the full. To level up, we got to let go. That's the hard part. And some of you, it's going to be the first time. Some of us, we do it all the time. And then we take it back and we got to do it again. But I want to give us an opportunity as a church. Let's just pray. He's here with us. Thank you, Lord. You said if we gather in your name, you show up. We need it. And as you're here with us, all of us have things we need to release to you. If it's you and you're thinking of something right now, you just want to open your hands and just, here you go, Jesus. Here's the pain I've been carrying. Here's the hurt I've been carrying. Here's the fear I've been carrying and trying to control. Here are the other people I've been trying to control. Here are the outcomes I've been trying to make work out just right. I'm releasing it to you now. Maybe it's your life and you just really need to hand the whole thing over to him. He'll take it. He wants to make him Lord, take his yoke. 
Lord, thank you that as we come to you with open hands, we leave your presence with full hands because you want so much more for us than you ever take from us. But for those of us today who've experienced your grace and your mercy and your love and your redemption and you've taken so much pain, junk, hurt, frustration, and sin away from our life, we just praise you. For those that haven't yet tested you in that way, I pray today would be a start of freedom. I thank you that joy is not only possible, but it's probable in you. I thank you that joy is not only an option, but it's, it's actually a function of your spirit. It's going to happen if we remain in you. Lord, so we're inviting you in to do what only you can do. Fill us. We're running into a bunch of stuff and we're wondering why we feel the way we do because that stuff can never fill us like you can. Fill us to overflow, Jesus. You're the vine, we're the branches. Thank you for your promises today. And, and I pray, Lord, for the joy of the Lord to be our strength. We need it, but this world needs to see it in somebody. And so I pray that we have it for our good, but for your glory. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this experience encouraged you. As part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. And if you need prayer or you'd like to get connected to any of the resources we mentioned, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always want to know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find links to our website and other Real Life resources that are available for you in the description area below. Thanks for spending part of your day with us. We want you to know that God loves you. We love you and we'll see you next time.